Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of the Three Consulting Amigos. You know, we've been at this for some time now, and we hope that you've really gotten something out of this. Today, I'm going to uh, kind of expand on what Ron said about marketing and what Ed said about um, finances last week. And today, I'm going to talk about six cultural ways to increase business value that you might find helpful because it's part of the eight drivers of business value. So without further ado, I'm going to move on. Um, at this point, let's take a look at the next slide here so we get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. There are six elements, as I mentioned. The first one, the businesses that I'm talking about, and they're known as conscious capitalists or responsible capitalists, but they maximize profit in relationship to people and the planet. Secondly, they tend to pay their employees well or more than their competitors, and they provide very generous benefits. Three, they pay taxes at a much higher rate than their uh, competitors. Four, they refrain from squeezing suppliers to get the lowest possible price. Five, they provide extraordinary customer value and service. And six, they invest in their communities so they can reduce their impact on nature. So those are the, the six elements. What I'm gonna do now is when I move forward, I'm gonna go into a little more detail to give you some ideas. One is they maximize profit in relationship to people and the planet. If you know anything about economics, Milton Friedman in 1970 famously said, there's only one purpose of a business and that is to maximize profit for the shareholders. And in that he said, anything else is socialism. Now, having said that, you know, the question was, and what these companies are now addressing is who are the stakeholders? And in that case, back then in 1970, Friedman was simply talking about people who make investments in the company specifically. Well, what we found is that there is a change in this and it's coming gradually, but it's moving more and more in the direction of, you also have to be able to take care of the people that work with you and around you in the communities, and you also have to take care of the planet. So in that context, the question that Wall Street's been asking is that it's too expensive, we can't fix it. And we're gonna show you as we go through this, that that's, that's a myth. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide, which is element number two. They pay their employees well and provide generous benefits. If you've ever been to Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's makes more per square foot than any other grocery chain. And if you go in, they're always busy, no matter when you go or where you go. They pay their employees above minimum wage and they provide health care for all their employees, whether you're part-time or not part-time. So they have a different way of looking at things that I think is important. Um, let's take a look here at number three. And in the meantime, uh, I want Ron and Ed to feel free to uh, give me some input as they uh, move ahead and see what's going on. Now, one of the challenges on this paying their employees well has been, we've always believed, and Ed and I actually have done this at a client, is that in order to get the kind of people you want, the way to start is to be able to offer more than other people are at the gate. And that means it's for some small business, that's, that can be a heavy lift. I mean, how are we gonna pay more than our competitors? But the truth is that's a screen and that screen can sometimes bring you higher quality people than if you pay them the same thing because all things being equal, an employee is gonna look for an opportunity to make more than he can someplace else. So keep that in mind because it can be very, very significant and there are ways we'll show you how you can uh, compensate for that additional income at the front end by getting better people at the back end. So uh, number three, they pay taxes at a much higher rate than others. One of the things that uh, Ed and I have found, and I don't know if Ron's seen this too, but you know, one of the challenges for using a, a CPA is a CPA has a specific focus, and that is to help you reduce your taxes. It makes him feel more important. But the sad part is, uh, Ed's, as I explained to you in the past, the challenge with that is that the guy may not know anything at all about your business. And the hard part, when you're getting ready to sell your business and you present your potential buyer with five years of, uh, of tax records, and then you ask for a price that doesn't have any reflection at all with the losses you took on your business, it creates a challenge. You have to overcome that. It seems to me that if you're willing to pay fair and taxes, it makes that uh, sales process less of a cumbersome issue because basically they don't have to keep wondering about why you did one thing 
on your taxes and you did something else in another venue. So while it's not either uh, good or bad, but our experience is that if you pay your taxes at a fair rate, which most of us, Gallup would tell you, would like to have people do, then you're much more likely to be able to get the kind of price that you're hoping for at the end. Uh, number four, let's take a look at this. They refrain from squeezing suppliers to get the lowest possible price. Over the years, uh, internally, I developed what I called a declaration of interdependence. And the purpose of this declaration was to get people on the inside of the company to agree on a way of behaving or treating one another that extended all the way from the senior management and owner down to the front line. And in doing that, we found that people were willing and able to change their behavior in order to get the best results for the company. As I was, have been learning more about uh, the ways conscious capitalists are doing this, they're saying, look, the entire company has to be thinking in terms of a declaration of interdependence. That means your suppliers, your, your finance community, uh, people who are in the government, et cetera, are all literally a part of your framework of declaring interdependence because when you start working more tightly together and you start helping people, they can help you through tough times. A supplier who really has a long-term relationship with you or a financier, when things get tough like they have here in COVID, what they'll do is they'll literally look at you and say, well, uh, I tell you what, we're gonna suspend payments for a couple of months while you get your feet back on the ground. And for some companies, that can be the difference between a bankruptcy or a closure and them actually being able to move forward. Number five, they provide extraordinary customer value and service. And one of the things that you know we know from having had experience, and all of us have either run companies or own companies, that extraordinary customer value and service is something that's incredibly important and if it's driving the bottom line, it can even be more valuable. The more your people understand that their customers have a choice and they can move to wherever they want, the more important it is for them to actually become your ambassadors out in the marketplace. A customer who is really, really happy, and we'll use Trader Joe's again as an example, or Whole Food Markets, another uh, example of conscious capitalists, and you'll find that they are, they are raving fans of the company and they'll tell other people, which is why per square foot, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's get more money than other companies who are doing well, but not doing as well as these companies are. And then number six, uh, they invest in their communities and reduce their impact on nature. Because they have three bottom lines, literally they say, look, we have to maximize profit because a company that can't make a profit can't survive. But in the context of that, they keep looking at it and saying, well, look, what do I need to do in my community or the people with whom we work or the people who live immediately around us to make their life more meaningful? And they're usually very philanthropic with the communities in which they exist, and that helps a lot. Furthermore, they understand that the impact we as humans are making on the planet are, are very, very significant. And they act either in concert with other people or in their own community to reduce the impact on the biosphere, which can have a very, very negative impact. So having said that, the question that obviously lurks in everybody's mind, can you do this and can you make a profit? So let's take a look at what the results have shown. And I'm gonna use two companies in the example here. One is local. It's called US Rubber, it's in Colton. And since it started in 1996, it's tripled its sales and the firm has kept 5 million tires out of landfills. Uh, the company serves its community through what they call their ch second chance hiring program. And 65% of their employees are former felons and they feel they can give these people a living wage and give them an opportunity and they have not been disappointed. Their people are stick, they are very loyal and they're very bright and they're able to make a difference. The second one I'm gonna list here is Whole Foods Market, which was started by John McKay back in the early 70s as kind of a natural food uh, co-op. Well, that single store has grown from there <laughs> with a bunch of hippies to $11 billion international juggernaut that was purchased recently by Amazon. 
and they've dedicated their business to whole foods, whole people, and whole planet. So these are two examples of businesses that have done very well. But I want, again, to illustrate uh, with, with measures and metrics what that literally means. So let me go to the next slide. Six cultural ways to increase business value. In the book, Firms of Endearment, it shows these companies using the six principles that have outperformed the standard and poor's 500 by 14 times over the last 15 years. And that's incredible. The companies we're talking about are on the right. Um, and these are companies, they didn't look at the financials until they had identified them as and adhering to these six cultural ways of, of increasing business value. So what this does, this breaks the myth of somehow suggesting that, that making a way to, to help your employees or help your community or help your planet is not expensive. It pays and it pays handsomely. So um, with that, I'm, I'm just about done. I wanted to see if there's any comments from either Ed or or Ron in terms of what we've talked about here and how this ties in with how you can really build additional value for your business and make it more uh, valuable when you sell so you can retire in a way that you had anticipated and hoped for. Well, I would say that you've got a, a thesis here that, uh, that you've attempted to support with these companies and examples, which are all, all good ones. <laughs> They, the, uh, the question that I would ask is that, uh, is, is really, um, are these companies valuable because they have those six traits or are, th do they have those six traits because they care about those uh, particular traits? And, and uh, uh, they also do all of the other things that are important in order to be able to make things work. Um, for instance, if you take a look at uh, BMW and, and several of these, Southwest, Starbucks, Timberland, um, some of these companies I know personally uh, from working with them. Uh, Timberland used to be a vendor of mine. I knew, knew the owners personally. These are companies that do have some of the characteristics that you're talking about. By the same token, they're valuable companies because they know how to make money and they use the value drivers that we've been going over in the last <clears throat> several sessions in order to create that value. I do think you can argue that, uh, when, and, and we have discussed this, that when you take a look at L.L. Bean, um, there's a brand there that uh, people will pay a little bit of a premium for. The question is, is L.L. Bean's brand uh, what it is because of all of these other six elements, or, or do they, they, obviously they do have an influence, but there may not be a direct relationship with that. Uh, well, and, that's possible. Excuse me? I, I think the point I was trying to make here, Ron, if this makes sense, is that maximizing profit is, is one of the enduring things that has to be done inside any, uh, uh, enterprise or else, you know, you don't have an enterprise, then you're either a nonprofit or you're something else. So I think the, the, the you know a lot thing of, that makes this different in my mind. We, we know a lot of you? companies that don't maximize profit and they do just fine. Um, they, they're little companies. You're, you're talking here about major corporations. And so when we take a look at the average small business that we've all worked with, uh, yeah, there, are, there are a huge number of them that, that don't maximize profit. And part of that is because they may care about these things that you've talked about. They may say, uh, you know, it's not important for me to be able to maximize profit because I'm willing to spend $20,000 a year on this particular promotion or to spend more money to try to uh, do more recycling or whatever. They may do that because they want to be good citizens, as you've, you've mentioned. But I would tend to say that smaller companies don't maximize profit nearly as big as the big ones do. Yes. They're all responding to the stock market price, and not all businesses are responding to a stock market. They're only responding to themselves. And um, we know plenty of folks who make so much money now and I'm not talking about billions, I'm talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands, uh, but they've accumulated several million dollars and they've got their cars and they've got their house, the, you know, 
And as we've talked about so many other times, so many small business people don't aspire to have a $20 million house. You know, $800,000 house in a nice neighborhood is just fine for them, thank you very much. And so they can do these kinds of things because they're not driven to maximize profits. Right. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm not uh, minimizing that. But I think the point is, you know, there, there are three elements that we're talking about. You, you have to have a sustainable business, which means whether you maximize the profit or you minimize it, it still has to be a profit or else the company is gone. The second thing is you have to, as much as possible, sustain the people in the communities in which you live. And that's an important thing. And then in their mind, these companies also see the importance of sustaining the biosphere and the, and the very thing that we all depend on. And so it doesn't say that they're maximizing one over the other, but they're trying to, to match them in such a way it doesn't exclude them from maximizing profit, which is where Friedman was going and, and the whole um, economy in terms of supporting stakeholders and shareholders specifically from Wall Street, as opposed to being a broader sense. And I think that's what I'm saying. Well, if, if you know, Friedman uh, didn't really say everybody should maximize profits and forget about everything else. Friedman, Friedman said, of course, you have to pay attention to your customers in so much as uh, they have to be treated well. You have to pay attention to your employees in so much as they have to be happy and they have to uh, con contribute to the stability of the company. In other words, he always made sure that everybody understood that there are things that every company has to do in order to be able to uh, subsist and stay in business, do well, create value. However, his point you know, was and, and, and still is, if you, if you don't focus on creating profitable value for your owners, either one owner or two owners, to a sufficient level, then you're not going to be successful because you won't have your investors anymore. That includes making sure that all of the stakeholders are happy. Now, right now, we're in this uh, interesting um, almost frenzy of a lot of uh, the big companies getting together and saying, oh, we got to do all these other things. I'm not convinced that that's anything more than a marketing uh, marketing scheme to be able to say, of course, we care about our employees, and of course, we care about the earth, and of course, we care about, you know, all of these things. And if it makes sense to get all of your people to think together and to reduce waste, that helps everybody, doesn't it? Oh, but, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, one of the focal points of this, and uh, there's a couple of good books out there. And in, in addition to uh, uh, conscious capitalism, which I recommend. There's also Donut Economics, and there's a book uh, called Two Second Lean. And basically, the guy is not an environmentalist by any long stretch, but he cites examples of saying when, when he had all of his employees focused on cutting waste, and, and he built a, a, a culture in which everybody was aboard, um, they, they began to dramatically cut waste in, in ways he had never seen. And he said to himself, geez, you know, we in, didn't intend to be green, but by doing this, we inadvertently became green. Um, and so, you know, the point is that, uh, as we are talking about this, is that when you move forward in ways to reduce waste, to improve the value of the, for the people around you, et cetera, the value of the company goes up, which is what we're trying to do and try to help these people who are own small businesses by saying, if you try these practices, these are ways in which you will gain, first of all, better employees, uh, you'll have an impact in the community, you'll get better customers, and as a consequence of all that, you'll not only make money, but the value of your business will increase, and that's what this has all been about. So uh, that's and, uh, that's the sum is what I'm talking about. Milton, Milton would, would agree with you wholeheartedly in that case. He did not, he did not say that, or suggest in any way that that should not be part of, uh, of what the economy and what businesses are about. Well, maybe he didn't, but I think a lot of businesses uh, uh, fail to see those other options. What they saw is, okay, I got to maximize profit. And in doing so, um, well, let me, let me cite an example that I think uh, is relevant here. Let me talk a little bit about this. While we know that CEO um, wages in terms of the overall growth, the top 300 make 300 times more 
than the average employee. And the irony of that, over the past 45 years, the, the pay for frontline employ, employees has been level. I mean, it hasn't increased without inflation at all. And so these companies are saying, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. Is there a way we can do something about this? And I'll give you an example. With Whole Foods, they have a literal, uh, literally there's nobody in the company. And that includes uh, uh, John McKay, who founded it, who makes 19 times more than any frontline clerk in a grocery store. Um, and they've done that specifically because they feel that this is the best way of demonstrating the authenticity of their, their value system. Um, so that's, that's an example. It's neither here nor there, but, but with that, they created an $11 billion company which, um, and, and they lost very few of their executives uh, to people or to companies who would pay them more because they were committed to the purpose of the company as defined here in these six cultural ways to increase business value. Well, I would, I would suggest to you that there are only maybe one small business in a thousand that, get, that take 19 times uh, more than what, what they're oh, low. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think all the businesses that you and I are working on, you know, none of them take enormous salaries. What they do, and this is a question you raised the other day, I think one of the one of the things that traps they fall into is they start making money, they start buying toys, and they start buying things, and they put themselves in debt. And then if there is uh, some kind of a black swan event like we're in the middle of, they can't survive because there is no cash to keep them going. And I remember uh, one of my clients who, during the last downturn in the late 90s, you know, I mean, he owned the property he was on and he set aside cash. And as the, the economy came back in the window company, he had a, he had a, he had a list on his wall. There, there was at one time over 20 some window manufacturers in Southern California because they, they were necessary at one point to be able to support the construction industry. But when we went through that downturn, so many of them hadn't had any cash reserves set aside that they, they went bankrupt. And at the end of that, he literally had lines, red lines through 18 of his competitors because they went bankrupt. And his point was that, you know, if, if you take care of your business and make sure you got reserves, you know, you can make a difference and you can change. And one of the things he did that was consistent with this is he paid all of his employees piecework. You know, the more they made, as long as it was within the quality constraints that were uh, evident in his marketplace, you know, you had to make sure you had quality windows. Um, these guys, these, these uh, Hispanic workers were taking home a thousand dollars a week, which in this industry was, was incredible. So, well, um, I, I, I like to weigh in a couple of thoughts. Um, one thing I like about this group, we get all different types of perspectives. And uh, I think corporate responsibility is an important aspect of any company, and um, it can have a positive impact on its valuation. And so I think you have to be mindful of that, but I think most a lot of companies aren't. And I think there's a real true advantage there if, if they figure out a way to better connect with the community and um, try to do things that are best for everyone in their community. Uh, I, I do want to say one thing on the tax side, uh, Ray. I, um, I think it's really important for any business to minimize their tax. Um, I don't think it makes any sense for any company to pay more tax than they're legally liable to pay. I'm not saying that was said in the presentation, but I just wanted to make sure that there was balance on that because um, you, there's tax rules and regulations and you play by those re re regulations and rules in determining what your taxes are. And I don't think there's very many people out there that are paying more taxes consciously um, because they want to. I mean, how do you, how would you address that comment? I wasn't well, I, sure what the point you made uh, is that there are changes that I think are gonna have to be made as we move forward in terms of loopholes that favor corporations in ways that are not necessarily good for either the economy or for the overall um, health and benefit of the entire nation. So, you know, part of our responsibility is that how do we create taxes that are fair and equitable uh, as opposed to loopholes, which are generated specifically to kind of help certain companies 
avoid taxes or have opportunities to be able to spend their or keep their money in tax shelters and havens outside of the nation, which deprives us of money we need to be able to just run our government, even even to be able to build military weapons. So that's right. that's you know, a that's, uh, that's uh, Congress's uh, responsibility. Yes. And uh, once they make the laws, businesses have to abide by them, and they have to they have to do what's best for them. Yes. So Jay, they, Jay, you're not two different things. You're more long term on this thing, and I'm more short term because. I think I'd be a crazy CPA if I came out and told people to pay more taxes than what they're uh, legally liable and paying. Yeah, Ray, you're not suggesting that businesses don't take advantage of whatever uh, tax tax opportunities there are, are you? I mean, you no, call no, not at all. But I'm I'm saying loophole, yeah. but the using the word loophole, uh, you know, it's not it's not a scientific term. That's that's just a, a term that you know, would have to be somebody's opinion. Is this an, a loophole or is that not a loophole? Yeah, sure, and, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, there's no way to solve that, but I, but I would, I would agree. Um, anybody looking at a business to buy would, and seeing that a business overpaid on their taxes would think that the owner was stupid. Yeah, I'm not. I have no problem with that. Well, those are the uh, kind of businesses you want to buy because you could, you could rectify that pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah. But so I, I hope this was helpful, guys. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously this was a different perspective, but, you know, my responsibility here was to provide the cultural differences I've seen out there and, and how, uh, as you can see from this example right here, uh, these have been very lucrative uh, um, principles that these companies have used. And so that's a, an important element of this. If, uh, if it hadn't proved to be this successful, I probably wouldn't have used this as an example. I'd like to make one other point though, Ray, and that is um, the importance of paying your uh, vendors and your employees properly. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think um, when things are really tough and you want people to step up and help help you, through uh, some tough times, it's really important that you have a good relationship with your employees and your suppliers that they're going to be there for you. It's more of a long-term relationship rather yes. than short-term. And yes. I think sometimes that, that point does get missed in, in business decisions. And I, I think that was, that was a really an excellent point you made. Well, it's funny because I mentioned the window company and uh, also in that he one time expressed to me that you know, while his employees are important, he says, without my suppliers, I, I, I wouldn't be here at all. And again, he addressed, you know, when he was going through the tough times along with all the other window companies, even though he had been able to save some, he had to dig deep into his pockets to be able to keep the business going. And one of the ways he was helped is he had some very large vendors who were willing to extend his payments out or even uh, say, look, why don't you suspend payments for six months until you get your feet on the ground? So to your point, Ed, it made, Without, without their active participation in his business, he too would have uh, succumbed. But the because they had a long-term relationship, he was able to keep it going. You've always mentioned uh, the importance of a high-performance culture. Uh -huh. And I couldn't agree with you more on that. And that is where you are creating exceptional value for a company. Uh, it's, it makes a lot of sense to share that in some type of a bonus or incentive or stock options or something like that so that everybody gets to be part of the reward for yes. doing exceptional work. Right. So right. I don't know how that all fits into your presentation, but I, I have always appreciated when you have brought that point up when we are out consulting with people. Well, I think one of the, one of the things, like I said, in this particular case, it was piecework, you know, uh, but sometimes you can't do piecework at a grocery store, as an example. And both Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, you know, pay probably a dollar fifty more per hour for their starting employees than other uh, similar grocery stores. And ironically, neither of them have unions, whereas most of the grocery industries you probably know are all unionized. So um, they they purposely try to differentiate themselves and and kind of secure themselves from unionization by simply doing the right thing without having to be forced to it. Um, and uh, as a consequence, they find that their um, staff, whether it's at a frontline level or a senior executive level, are much more loyal than some of their competitors.
Yeah, I think that's true, uh, particularly for Trader Joe's. I do think I do think it's a fair question to ask: is the is the sales per square foot driving the ability to do that, or is it the higher salaries that provide the dollars per square foot? I think no, it's it's, 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 it's it's the sales per square foot. Well, I'm, you know, not so, sure, I'm not sure there's proof in that particular one, but but I think it's a legitimate question. Right, and I and I have I'm sorry I didn't show the number of square foot you know, the, the sales per square foot, but Costco, and we have, we have a stunning example here because, you know, you live here in San Bernardino and literally there's a Costco on one block off a of tippy canoe and there's a, um, a Sam's club on the other. The Sam's club lot is usually half full and it's hard to get into the Costco. Um, and you know, the difference in the way they treat their employees is dramatic. And as a consequence, uh, Walmart has, has, struggle to, to match the kind of performance levels that Costco has done. Yeah, that's and, true. And they sell an, ast uh, an astounding amount per square foot in Costco's. So, uh, Ray, I, I, I really appreciate this different perspective on a lot of different things that we deal with on a daily basis. I, I think being well balanced is a positive and uh, a potential for adding value to any company. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, thank you guys for your input. Uh, and again, you know, my intention here was to kind of add a different point of view. For we've had the marketing side, you've got to grow the business. And then of course, you know, without being able to know where it is, and one of the issues that, you know, we addressed when we had this meeting the other day, Ed, is that, you know, without having a clear understanding of what the numbers are and how to measure them and what they mean, you know, it's hard to know how to grow your company. So, you know, this, this is one more additional way of being able to uh, differentiate yourself from your competitors. And even in small companies, that's why I use the example of U.S. Rubber here in Colton, because it's amazing how well they've done by virtue of just starting off and doing something differently. And their feedstock comes from another company that actually Ron and I had a pleasure of working with almost a decade ago, uh, which is Re-Rubber. I don't know if you remember that, Ron. But, uh, J.D. Wang, you know, started this company by deconstructing tires and uh, roughly 80% of all the crumb material that goes to U.S. rubber comes directly from re-rubber that made this business out of taking uh, what would otherwise go into landfills and using it to create a new product. It's really, yeah. Uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah, fabulous. Like, yeah, we did a good job of it. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I think we have we hit we're at 411. So I know this is going to go off in a minute. Uh, I want to thank um, both Ed and Ron for participating in this and giving me their insights. Uh, we'll be uh, back at it in a week. Uh, we're going to we'll, we may announce later what we're going to be moving on in, in, in specifics. But I can guarantee you our next topic will help you as you move on your journey to be able to exit your business and get the kind of retirement you were hoping for. And at the same time, help your community, help your employees and protect the biosphere. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you in another week.